Greetings, everyone, and welcome back. Today we start Revolutions and New Nations in the Atlantic World, which corresponds with Chapter 28 in our main textbook. We've already looked at this part of the world before. Uh, this is mainly Europe and the Americas, the Atlantic uh, Ocean being in between them. Uh, and uh, in earlier units, we saw the Europeans going about their business, uh, which is a euphemism for conquest and colonization uh, in the Americas. In this unit, we look at domestic events revolving around revolution. Revolutions occurred in uh, multiple places in the Americas uh, in the late 19th or late 18th or 19th centuries uh, and in Europe as well. We won't be touching on all of them, uh, but uh, uh, we'll highlight, spotlight uh, uh, the, the big ones. Uh, at least the ones that are, again, most prominent for our class. Uh, Bentley tells us uh, that drawing on Enlightenment ideals, back to the Enlightenment momentarily, revolutionaries of the 18th and 19th centuries sought to fashion an equitable society by instituting governments that were responsive to the needs and interests of the peoples they governed, which is to say that these revolutions uh, incline in a, a democratic direction. Uh, they tend to be uh, uh, in favor of and fighting for uh, in implementing representative participatory government, or we call democracy today, at least moving in that direction. So uh, what follows uh, comes kind of in the following order. I will first uh, sort of set things up as an introduction by comparing and contrasting the American and French revolutions. Uh, then we'll look at the Enlightenment, I'll explain what it is uh, and how it relates to uh, these revolutions and revolution in general. Then we'll take a look at the American Revolution, uh, the French Revolution, which followed it by several years and to some degree uh, uh, emulated it or tried to, uh, and then the various Latin American revolutions, uh, which include a revolution in Haiti, the only successful, uh, at least large-scale slave revolution uh, uh, of all time, uh, so uh, slaves took over the uh, whole island. It had been a French colony. We'll deal with that. And we'll talk about uh, Simon Bolivar uh, and some of the other uh, heroes uh, that carried out uh, revolutions in one or another uh, Spanish uh, colonies uh, in uh, South America. Uh, and lastly, we'll take a look at the political isms that uh, grew up during this time. And these are important because uh, it gets us back to one of the three uh, themes at the outset of our class, uh, and this is the uh, influence of ideology, uh, growing influence uh, worldwide. So our politicalisms uh, include liberalism, conservatism, socialism, republicanism, which is another way to say democracy, but uh, it's not an ism, so republicanism keeps it consistent, uh, and nationalism. Uh, and these, uh, it will pay to study, not just here, but going forward, because all of these isms uh, will come back uh, and help us inform uh, world history moving into the late 19th uh, century and into the, 20, into the 20th. You can see on the map here uh, that the American Revolution on the left, uh, French Revolution on the right, uh, the Latin American revolutions uh, down uh, below. So sort of a, a triangle, uh, uh, something like the triangular trade, but not the same, not the same destinations completely. So the American revolutionary model uh, versus the French revolutionary model. So if you were planning your own revolution, uh, uh, you have two different models to go on here. Uh, and I would pick, I would advise you to pick the American revolutionary model, not the French one. Uh, if you'd like things to say, stay sane uh, and keep from getting irrational and hysterical, the American uh, version uh, and brand uh, and model is better than the French one. Uh, that's putting it mildly, actually. Uh, revolutionaries in a suit and a tie. And what does this mean? Uh, I, I stole this uh, phrase from a historian that I like, uh, writes good books on this uh, exact subject, the American Revolution. But, uh, and I think I've at least touched on this uh, in uh, this class already before, uh, but it bears uh, some scrutiny now. The, the point that's being made here, clever turn of phrase, but is that the American revolutionaries, uh, fortunately for us, were quite responsible revolutionaries in a suit and a tie. Uh, uh, so they were dressed up, uh, adult, you know, decision makers, responsible, practical, common sense oriented, 
uh, and uh, their revolution uh, then uh, was limited in the sense that it, it worked uh, hard uh, to not get out of control. So uh, uh, that's not that's not what happened in France, uh, even though the French uh, had the Americans as their own model coming uh, years afterwards and tried to copy uh, and emulate the American Revolution in some ways. We could see this as coming down to common sense, experience, and tradition on one side, the American side, uh, versus utopian rationalism uh, on the other side, the French side. Uh, and a way to get us started in this direction uh, is from a, a recent book, fairly recent book, uh, that's uh, uh, listed below. Uh, and the author says, a key reason the American Revolution succeeded was it strictly limited, was, it, was its strictly limited scope. The founders, uh, founding fathers, sought only liberty, not equality or fraternity. We'll come back to that. They, they aimed to make a political revolution, not a social or economic one, and they didn't seethe with old world intensity or of social rancor uh, and class rage. Uh, their Lockean uh, social contract political philosophy taught them that the preservation of individual liberty was the goal of politics. Uh, Americans didn't take up arms to create a new world order according to some abstract theory. That's what the French did. Uh, uh, they sought only to restore the political liberty they had actually experienced themselves for 150 years as colonies of the British, uh, and they constructed their new government to preserve it. So uh, let's take, and this requires some unpacking, this entire quote, but let's take the last part first. Uh, what the author is saying here is that in some ways the American Revolution was conservative. Uh, they were certainly striking out independently, of course, for the first time uh, and creating a new government, but it was based, uh, much of the government that it, you know, came about uh, eventually with the Constitution uh, and the government we have to this day uh, was uh, the American colonists, colonial uh, leaders, uh, you know, a number of them, huge names today, George Washington, etc., uh, uh, believed what they were doing uh, was saying, as English citizens, uh, we've been deprived of our rights here in the colonies, uh, and we're fighting to, to get our rights back, our liberties uh, back. So uh, these were educated, uh, uh, right, uh, English citizens living on this side of the Atlantic, uh, as colonists of the British, but they were afforded a British uh, and European education, uh, and they learned about and were proud of the concept of liberties uh, under the English Constitution, uh, and they're claiming uh, before the American Revolution that the British government uh, has deprived them of their ancient, old, uh, age-old liberties, uh, and they're saying we want them back, We're gonna, and we'll fight uh, to get them back. So in that sense, it's conservative. They're fighting to get something back, uh, not to change uh, something. Uh, but it's not conservative, of course, in every way. Uh, the At the outset of this quote, uh, that the American revolutionaries sought liberty, not equality, uh, that sounds jarring to us today. Uh, and it's certainly true that the American revolutionaries at that point uh, uh, weren't uh, uh, as sold on democracy as we would be today. Uh, so uh, it makes sense that liberty would win out over equality. But the truth is that even in a modern democracy, it's not easy to square liberty uh, with equality. Uh, it can be done. Our system does it. But it's not. It's, it's never a sort of a, an easy fit. Uh, the two aren't kind of necessarily as natural allies as we might think. Uh, because the more uh, you structure equality into the system, the more you take away uh, liberty. You have to take away a certain amount of liberty uh, to bring about equal outcomes. Uh, and our founding fathers, our big names here, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, etc., uh, uh, were not uh, uh, interested uh, in uh, uh, that kind of thing. They, wa they wanted to create a society, again, going back to John Locke, the English uh, political theorist and philosopher uh, of the late 17th century, uh, who very much believed that uh, government should be structured around the concept of individual liberty, 
uh, and in such individual liberty was a natural right, a God-given right, as Jefferson's Declaration of Independence would also echo uh, later on in the middle of this revolution. So liberty, uh, 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 freedom to own property, freedom of speech, uh, basic civil liberties, freedom of religion, uh, uh, they believed that this was the most important uh, way uh, and path to a good, fair, you know, honest, uh, happy society. Uh, not equality, at least equality of outcome. They did believe in equal rights, uh, equal rights, but not equal outcomes, uh, where you know, everybody has to uh, have sort of the same uh, of everything. Uh, in fact, they were dead set against that. Uh, the French were not. Uh, uh, the French were trying for liberty, equality, and fraternity. We'll leave fraternity kind of out of the mix for now. Uh, but the, the problem with equality isn't that it's not desirable. Of course it is in many ways. Uh, the problem is, how do you get how do you get to it? Uh, what if not everybody wants to be equal? What if some people have more uh, than other people? Uh, and this is what I think our founding fathers in the United States saw more clearly and responsibly than their peers across the Atlantic in France. Uh, and that is that uh, even though equality is desirable, to get there, you have to basically legislate that. Somebody has to decide. Somebody has to decide what it it means how we're going to make everyone equal because not everyone's going to go along. Uh, so you have the, the real possibility of tyranny uh, and unjust power, uh, uh, you know, or at least arbitrary power, uh, coming in and saying, "Hey, you're not equal. Sorry, we're taking this. We're taking your land. We're taking your business. We're taking this. We're taking that." Uh, and uh, uh, you, you have to do it more or less at gunpoint, at least with those that are going to be giving up something, uh, not acquiring more than they already had. So uh, uh, equality isn't as easy as it sometimes sounds to us. Uh, and in this case, uh, we see uh, is a, kind of a utopian dream of a perfect equal society uh, that doesn't turn out that way. In fact, it turns out to, to be an utter disaster uh, uh, in the French Revolution and its reign of terror, as we'll uh, find out, uh, uh, because uh, you have to use such uh, uh, stuff such tough uh, methods, uh, violence, uh, you know, coercion, threat of violence, uh, in order to uh, get everyone to accept uh, equality. So the American revolutionaries just didn't even try. So th they were, as it says, doing something of more strict, strictly limited scope, uh, uh, but that was practical. Uh, it was, I think, uh, more realistic. Uh, by contrast, as the same author says, the French Revolution illuminated uh, uh, by America's example and enlightenment thought, uh, began in blissful optimism, but collapsed into a blood-soaked tyranny, uh, much worse than the monarchy it deposed, uh, uh, and 25 years of turmoil followed it. Uh, so France uh, was rocked by 25 plus, really, years of turmoil uh, after the French Revolution, and didn't, uh, uh, even after that, have as rock solid a government uh, and legal system and society uh, uh, in hand uh, as their American, again, friends across the Atlantic did. So the Enlightenment, what was it uh, and uh, how does it relate to revolution? Uh, a recent uh, book on the Enlightenment, a very good one, uh, says no group of people had done so much to change society's general way of thinking. Uh, meaning uh, than the Enlightenment thinkers, who you see before you here in this picture uh, at uh, one of the famous salons uh, in and around Paris, where intellectuals, writers, uh, scientists, sometimes politicians, artists, uh, 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 philosophers got together uh, to uh, talk about important ideas. These were parties, by the way, as well, uh, but uh, they, they were parties designed to bring talented intellectuals, uh, talented uh, bright uh, uh, thinkers and writers together uh, uh, to discuss important topics, religion, politics, uh, philosophy, uh, it's, it's science, etc. Uh, so uh, this is what the Enlightenment was, uh, but let's go a little bit further. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement, uh, and we'll come back to that. An intellectual movement means a constellation of ideas. So uh, if sort of a new set of ideas come together in any one time and place, and that's what's happening here, and if they make enough of a splash that they uh, eventually reach a critical mass and turn over the way that society, 
a group of people thinks uh, about their world, uh, then it's an intellectual movement. Uh, and all of those things do uh, apply here. So this is a new set of ideas mixed with some old ideas that reach such a critical mass at some point. It kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, bubbled uh, up and over uh, and uh, changed the way Europeans uh, and American colonists and, uh, you know, uh, colonists of many European countries in the Americas thought about the world and the way they acted on the world. Uh, since they, uh, if they think differently about the world, they're likely to do different things. So an intellectual movement uh, uh, has those uh, uh, parameters to it, uh, has those ingredients. Uh, and by this uh, definition, which is a working definition, the Renaissance, uh, uh, if you happen to know something about that, uh, we did, talked about it only a little bit earlier, uh, but it qualifies as an intellectual movement. The scientific revolution, which we did talk about, is an intellectual movement, and the one that preceded this, uh, and so uh, in that vein, we have talked about the Enlightenment a little bit already, uh, but uh, it's in roughly the 18th century that the Enlightenment uh, has this uh, um, sees these ideas come together and reach the critical mass. It's usually seen to be centered in France, uh, but it was European-wide and even beyond, certainly to the, the colonies. The American colonists were very much Enlightenment educated and oriented and contributed their own thought and writing uh, to the Enlightenment. Uh, but the Enlightenment then is a a sort of a new way of looking at the world, uh, which changed the way Europeans looked at the world forever, and it's still very much with us. Uh, it's still uh, very much part of our value system today for good uh, or, or good and bad. Uh, and th this then, uh, uh, it it's odd that we don't learn that much about it uh, as Americans, since it is so influential and has been ever since the 18th century. Uh, but uh, the Enlightenment was not just about ideas and new ideas. The Enlightenment and its thinkers wanted to change the world. Uh, they believed they had the recipe uh, to uh, change the world and make it better, to improve it, uh, uh, to make progress. Uh, and so this is sort of the, 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 the big thing, is that uh, there are new ideas, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, th this intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment, uh, believed that they had uh, sort of the, the key uh, to how to uh, bring society uh, you know, make society uh, uh, better, uh, make standard of living higher, uh, economic improvements, make human beings behave better. So economic, really kind of technological and moral improvement. And they believed that uh, uh, with the right plan, uh, the right ideas, the right uh, emphases, uh, that this uh, could be achieved. So they were extremely excited about it. To put it That's putting it mildly. Uh, Looking at a recent book on the Enlightenment uh, to give us a, a little more uh, meat on the bone here, uh, the author says, Enlightenment philosophers sought not merely to interpret the world, but also to change it, which I just said. Uh, indeed, they believed that it was their duty to do so. But although some of them were not shy in acknowledging that Enlightenment uh, is justly accused uh, as the cause of revolutions, uh, most Enlightenment intellectuals are correctly read as advocating peaceful change through free inquiry, public discussion, and institutional reform. Uh, Enlightenment intellectuals were strongly committed to the task of shaping life itself and actually bringing about the order of things uh, which they conceived as necessary, uh, believed that specific institutions and social practices play key roles in shaping human lives. Uh, and were convinced that initiating a certain fundamental, uh, in, initiating certain fundamental changes in human institutions and social practices would facilitate a deeper moral transformation of human life, and held that it was humanity's duty to undertake these changes. So uh, much of that is sort of a fancier way of saying what I said before, uh, but sometimes studying uh, uh, it's useful to uh, look at things uh, the same ideas worded in different ways. Uh, so you go back and study this uh, and study uh, what I just said by listening to the recording again. Heaven forbid. Uh, and uh, the same author goes on to say uh, that the Enlightenment thinkers, philosophers as they're sometimes called, uh, called for an in-depth scientific analysis that could be studied uh, in uh, the social dimension, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers or person social dimension for the purpose of redefining our concept of morality and politics. Compared to the previous century, 
the 17th century, which focused on the natural sciences, assigning primacy to the language of physics and mathematics, uh, and to uh, 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 <laughs> machines, I guess, what it was the 18th, sorry, I have it uh, incorrect there. The 18th century and the Enlightenment extended the domain of the scientific revolution to unexplored worlds. Uh, new disciplines came into being, such as political economy, basically economics, and the foundations were laid for modern rational sociology and anthropology. History and law were radically transformed, their theoret theoretical bases redrawn from the viewpoint of the subject. The groundbreaking invention of the rights of man uh, as central to the political vocabulary of the moderns is itself part of the historical developments that made up this brand new cultural system. So what's being said here, I'll get, again in a pretty fancy way, is that the social sciences were born uh, uh, in and of the Enlightenment, during the Enlightenment. This is the beginning of the social sciences, uh, political science, economics, sociology, anthropology, psychology, etc. Now, they didn't call those subjects psychology and economics yet, uh, but uh, if you take uh, uh, introductory courses in any of those subjects, usually the textbook, uh, and the professor uh, will start by going back to the Enlightenment and showing you kind of the birth uh, of the discipline uh, uh, subject there. Uh, so uh, keep in mind here, uh, uh, again, this is worded uh, by the author uh, in a somewhat confusing way, uh, but, but I like what he's saying overall uh, uh, in sort of two little chunks here, so I provide it. Uh, but uh, again, I'll unpack it for you. In some ways, you could say that the Enlightenment is the scientific revolution or scientific method as a major part of the scientific revolution applied to human and social problems. So the science, and it's more or less says this here, natural science, sciences uh, really versus kind of social sciences. So the Enlightenment thinkers were very excited by the discoveries uh, of Isaac Newton and Galileo and others, the scientists of the uh, uh, previous century primarily, uh, and science was still you know, moving apace in this century as well. But these thinkers, the Enlightenment thinkers, were mainly interested in scientific method, uh, the method that Newton and others used to come to conclusions to learn about the physical world. Again, the world of physics and uh, uh, motion and optics, etc., uh, and and they're excited here to say, you know what? Look at what, look how potent a tool, a scientific method has been to understand the physical world. Newton's law of gravity. Oh my goodness! Uh, what if we took that same method, scientific method, and turned it in a different direction, and aimed it at uh, human uh, and social problems and issues, aim it at uh, human institutions like government uh, and economic systems and use that method to understand those systems, understand human psychology uh, so that we can improve uh, the world, uh, improve human life, uh, improve societies. So scientific method uh, applied to social and human problems. You could see how they'd be excited about this uh, since uh, there was no reason to believe at that point uh, that it couldn't be done. Uh, with uh, almost as much or as much precision uh, as uh, the hard uh, sciences of physics and chemistry uh, and astronomy were already doing. So let's look at the Enlightenment project, uh, the project part of it, meaning they had uh, this whole set of ideas uh, and they wanted to use them to reform uh, and improve the world. Uh, and the first uh, value, and I've shortened these here for our purposes, uh, 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 progress. Progress is one of the West's greatest motifs, or great motifs, uh, as uh, current intellectual Samuel Gregg uh, says. So progress means, of course, things getting better. Uh, if we're making progress, it means we're improving. I, don't, I mean, anybody, if you say, hey, we're making progress here uh, on, uh, you know, putting in, a, a, you know, a new lawn in our backyard, right? We're, we're, and we're, we're getting there. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, so progress means things improving. But progress with a sort of capital P uh, is sort of a belief that things uh, can uh, and sometimes will improve. Uh, some of the Enlightenment thinkers will see uh, the most uh, utopian among them, and there were some utopians in here, uh, there are some in here, uh, believe that human life could be perfected. Uh, we can make progress to the point where uh, uh, we live in a utopia. Uh, not many of them believe that. They weren't that optimistic, uh, 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 but a few of them were. 
uh, but they believed that progress was certainly possible and very desirable, uh, and they believed they had basically the plan. We've got the ideas, we just need to uh, institute them, which wasn't easy in itself because these are intellectuals, writers, philosophers, etc. They're usually not politicians, with the exceptions, and they're certainly not the kings of countries. So uh, the, the biggest uh, difficulty in implementing any of these reform ideas uh, was to convince kings and governments uh, to implement them, uh, which wasn't impossible. Some of these guys had uh, connections to power, uh, but uh, you know, that, that's sort of a second step. The first step is getting the right ideas, uh, uh, having sort of somewhat of a somewhat of a plan. This was never one blueprint or plan, but uh, let's put it in a general sense, uh, have a plan. But the second step is to sell that plan to those who, who have the power to implement it, uh, governments. Uh, reason and scientific method applied to human and social issues. So there it is. Uh, a trust in the empirical sciences power to remake the world. Uh, as Samuel Gregg, same guy, also says, uh, empirical sciences means those that gather uh, evidence, uh, gather sort of hard evidence, look, bring them back to the lab, analyze them, uh, sort of hard uh, data, uh, and draw conclusions from there. And they believe that this um, again, this, this application of scientific method and others uh, uh, could remake the world uh, for the better. Uh, so uh, use of reason applied to science. But they really meant reason applied to science only for the most part. They didn't mean uh, like old-fashioned philosophy where you sit around and think about uh, metaphysics and ethics and things like that. Uh, they were mainly interested in what we could call and sometimes is called instrumental reason. Uh, which means reason applied only to things that can be verified through scientific evidence, uh, gathering of evidence, data, uh, and math, uh, and not things that we have to kind of speculate uh, about only uh, because you know, we, we don't have scientific evidence. For instance, ethics and morality, th those aren't subjects of scientific inquiry because you can't, science doesn't tell you what to do uh, with scientific discoveries or pieces of technology invented by science for science. You can build an, a nuclear weapon with science and the knowledge uh, you get through science. Uh, that's one thing. But science doesn't doesn't tell you what to do with the nuclear weapon. doesn't tell you whether it's a good or a bad idea uh, to use that on other human beings. That's an ethical and moral question that goes beyond uh, what science can do. So they were mainly interested in this, the, the scientific thinking, scientific uses of reason, uh, which kept them... Uh, interested in knowing how the world worked and how we can change it, uh, not why uh, the way the world worked, which is a much more philosophically oriented question. Uh, science really looks at the how, uh, not the why. They also wanted useful knowledge, uh, and uh, this basically uh, means uh, uh, the how type of knowledge or instrumental reason. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I forgot this was next on my list, so I already kind of covered this. Uh, uh, but since I'd hidden them all here, I'd forgotten that part too, uh, unveiling them one at a time. Uh, but useful knowledge uh, as opposed to useless knowledge? Well, yeah. Uh, to the Enlightenment thinkers sitting around philosophizing about things that uh, you know don't affect or improve the real world is kind of pointless and a waste of time. Not entirely, but that's the that's the gist. Reformed institutions. This shouldn't surprise us. Uh, on the previous slide, we saw a quote that talked about this a bit. Uh, but uh, they believe that uh, you know, with the right application, with progress in mind, with reason and scientific method in hand, instrumental reason, uh, that uh, we can aim these at political systems, uh, certain departments within political systems, economic systems, educational systems, and on and on, and improve them. Uh, we can use scientific method, study, and research uh, to improve uh, the world we live in by improving its institutions, at least in part. The science of man. Uh, they wanted to understand human nature, uh, and this really is the beginnings of what we today call psychology. Uh, but uh, there was a, a, a twist to it in those days. Uh, uh, they believed that human nature, uh, and this isn't true of every Enlightenment thinker, but overall, uh, uh, in, in the general picture, is pretty much the uh, the thinking uh, uh, of the Enlightenment that human nature was fixed, uh, that it wasn't very uh, not maybe not completely, but it wasn't very pliable, it wasn't very malleable. Human nature was uh, 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 you know, is what it is, uh, and the the key is then to sort of figure out what human nature is, uh, and when you do that, 
uh, uh, it's easier than to design and reform institutions to make progress, to use scientific method uh, effectively, uh, because you're starting to understand man, human beings. And again, they said man uh, in those days. Uh, man was a you know, catch-all term for human beings. Uh, however sexist that may have been, uh, they meant hu humanity. So uh, the science uh, here uh, of uh, human beings uh, uh, meant that you know uh, we can figure out what human nature is, uh, and it doesn't and it doesn't really change. Uh, so uh, they were very eager to dig into this subject and did. They believed, for instance, that uh, one aspect of human nature. Uh, uh, and again, this is, of course, arguable, uh, but they believed it was clear from human nature that human beings have a naturally selfish component to them. Uh, uh, they didn't say that that's all human beings were. They believed human beings had a, uh, a moral component to them as well. They had the capacity to feel uh, you know, uh, empathy for other people uh, that was uh, a part of their nature. But they uh, also believed that human beings had uh, uh, in their nature, uh, born with it, uh, they didn't know about genetics, but they you know, would have said that if they did. It was genetic that human beings uh, are, are born uh, to, uh, at least in part, uh, uh, think uh, you know, uh, about themselves first. So uh, the whole idea of individual rights, individual liberties, uh, which is part and parcel of the Enlightenment, the American and French revolutions, uh, is tied uh, to this concept of human nature, uh, which sees it as natural. Uh, uh, which doesn't mean it's always good, but as natural for human beings to think in terms of their own self-interest. Uh, what's in my interest as opposed to just doing things, uh, uh, you know, magnanimously uh, uh, for others. Individual liberty and equal rights uh, uh, flow uh, from this. Uh, life, liberty, and property in the famous phrase of John Locke and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, the uh, slight alteration that Thomas Jefferson made uh, when writing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, although Thomas Jefferson was certainly uh, a believer uh, in the protection uh, of government and legal protection for private property, partly because he owned a lot of it himself. Uh, but uh, you know, he was he was not uh, again interested as none of these guys were uh, in uh, big uh, schemes to redistribute wealth on a large scale, if at all. Uh, so, and uh, so this, uh, uh, the whole Enlightenment uh, believed uh, that sort of society has to be built for it to be fair uh, and to be good and to improve, improve has to be built around uh, uh, individual uh, rights, individual liberty, individual freedom. Uh, you have the right to live the life that you want, as long as you're not, you know, doing something illegal uh, you know, or that hurts somebody else and gets in the way of their liberty. Sometimes that happens, so it can be messy, uh, but they believe that individual liberty uh, was the kind of cornerstone of building uh, a decent society. Equality you see there, but it's equal rights. Uh, so everybody uh, has the equal, that's in theory, by the way, this is the principle, doesn't mean it was always true in reality, but the principle was uh, that uh, uh, government's job was uh, to create a society and a you know, government and a system of laws uh, that protected your opportunity to achieve, uh, you know, happiness and uh, acquire property, uh, uh, etc. Notice that Thomas Jefferson's phrase is "life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness." We tend to forget about the pursuit. So uh, that phrase is telling, because Jefferson and his colleagues uh, are saying uh, we're not saying that government owes you happiness. We're saying it owes you to, uh, you know, uh, it owes you the. Uh, they're required to create a climate that allows you to pursue happiness uh, realistically, but you have to go get it yourself. You have to, you have to pursue it yourself. But it's government's job to kind of clear the way so that you have an opportunity to do that. Uh, and, and there is a, a, a important distinction there, which brings us to John Locke himself. I'm not going to read all of these slides, uh, uh, but you could go back and study them profitably uh, here. Uh, John Locke uh, influenced Enlightenment thought. He's one of the early uh, thinkers uh, uh, of the Enlightenment uh, in lots of ways. Uh, for here, I'll, I'll just focus on one thing, and that is the idea of the blank slate. Uh, he wrote about education uh, and how human beings know what we know, which is called uh, epistemology. 
uh, and uh, his conclusion uh, uh, about uh, the blank slate was that human beings are born uh, without knowing anything uh, or born without any pre-existing knowledge, uh, that the mind is a blank slate, tabula rasa, at birth. Uh, uh, partly what he was getting at is there were many people that believed that human beings are born uh, with an understanding of God, for instance, already. It's already, it's already kind of written into them, baked into their uh, you know, their, their DNA. Uh, and Locke said, it's just not true. Uh, but the Enlightenment itself as a whole, Enlightenment thinkers and enlightened European society throughout the course of the 18th century, loved Locke, Locke's idea of the blank slate. Uh, why? Because if it's correct, uh, right, uh, that uh, it's saying that then uh, one of the ways we can make progress, maybe the, one of the, the fastest routes, is to make sure that we educate children uh, who are blank slates uh, there uh, properly uh, and fill up their brains, uh, their blank uh, you know, uh, brains with enlightenment ideas uh, from the time they first learn. Uh, and so they'll know, know nothing but enlightenment. Uh, and you know, the next generation and generation beyond that will be fully enlightenment educated uh, and inclined to think in enlightenment uh, uh, you know, terms uh, and uh, you know, enlightenment ways. So uh, now, now, is the mind a blank slate? No. Uh, it's not. It's still popular to think so, by the way, uh, in the social sciences and humanities, uh, but it isn't a blank slate. Uh, uh, science, biology, uh, uh, tell us that clearly. Um, neuroscience, uh, it's not a blank slate. Nonetheless, uh, it's what was believed by the Enlightenment thinkers, partly because they wanted to believe it. Uh, if the mind is full of all kinds of things uh, that could get in the way of Enlightenment ideas, that's, that's tougher, uh, uh, sort of, you know, it's tougher to make progress. Uh, but if you can just fill the blank slate up with enlightenment ideas and that's all that's in there, uh, um, you know, the, the better for you and your society if you're an enlightenment, uh, uh, you know, uh, individual or thinker. Uh, Adam Smith, philosopher as social scientists and one could say economist. Uh, uh, he was a philosophy professor in Scotland, uh, part of the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, which a number of brilliant uh, professors uh, and intellectuals from Scotland that contributed a great deal to Enlightenment thought, uh, as there were Americans. Uh, but Smith uh, was a philosophy professor, but oddly enough, his most famous book, which you see on the right, The Wealth of Nations, uh, was uh, a uh, uh, the quintessential work on uh, market uh, economics or free market economy. Uh, and in that book, he was... Uh, in a sense, it was a, a user's manual uh, for uh, prospective politicians. And he was training uh, a lot of the sons of nobility from England who came to study under him and then went on to uh, be government leaders later on. Uh, and so he was kind of teaching them, okay, here's how uh, uh, our economy in Great Britain could and should work if we reform it in an enlightenment direction. So here's an example of a guy writing something that was designed to change institutions uh, in this case, uh, England's economy, uh, uh, for the better. Uh, and he did believe, uh, through long study of this, uh, that a free market economy uh, was the best uh, uh, way uh, to bring about uh, uh, well, at least economic uh, progress. Uh, so uh, Wealth of Nations uh, is still, uh, to this day, kind of the, seen as the most thoroughgoing uh, sort of pro-capitalist tract. Uh, although he wasn't blindly... Uh, uh, you know, kind of blind faith uh, oriented pro-capitalist. Uh, he was critical of corporations. Uh, he was critical of capitalists themselves. He didn't totally trust them, uh, but he did believe it's, you know, with even with the problems, one of the problems being arrogant, you know, r rich guys, uh, it's worth it uh, to let them get rich because uh, uh, they'll drag the system along and it'll make all of us at least marginally better off. And that was the main reason that he supported and believed that uh, a free market economy uh, was the best type of economy, not because it allowed a handful of people to become super rich, though it did. Uh, uh, he said, we're going to have to put up with that. Uh, uh, you know, These rich jerks are going to get richer and richer, become more arrogant probably, uh, but don't tell them uh, that we're, we're supporting them, not because we love them or like them at all, but because they're going to help lead us in the direction where uh, the majority of us are going to become at least moderately better off. Uh, and so uh, since so many people will be at least somewhat better off, uh, it's worth it to let the handful of rich jerks uh, uh, get uh, you know, more and more wealthy.
but you can see how that's very uh, enlightenment, uh, progress oriented. Uh, and this that book, Wealth of Nations, was designed or was written for practical purposes uh, to reform and change institutions uh, to make human life and society uh, better. Uh, at least in, the, in this, that case, the economy. Uh, Baron Montesquieu, a Frenchman of noble birth, a nobleman who wrote the Persian Letters, uh, the Spirit of the Laws, about 20 plus years apart from each other, uh, his two uh, uh, great books, but he wrote other things as well. Uh, but he was a, a major contributor to thinking about government reform and uh, change in uh, you know, uh, government structure, uh, a political theorist, among other things. Uh, he believed in constitutional government, and he believed that power needed to be spread out to avoid tyranny. Uh, so uh, he was uh, not uh, happy with much of what he saw in Europe, uh, at least where absolute monarchies existed, uh, which uh, uh, where he lived, France was one of them, uh, and thought, no, we can't, we can't trust anybody. Uh, no, no single person should have all the power. Uh, because they'll abuse it. Even a nice guy, uh, a nice person, uh, too much power leads to abusive power. So power needs to be spread out in governments. And so Montesquieu is the primary uh, person influencing American colonial thinkers like Jefferson and Hamilton and Madison uh, in the direction of separation of powers and checks and balances. Uh, which is very much part of our constitutional government and system to this day. So Locke was influential uh, on uh, the American colonists uh, in his limited government theory, which I didn't cover in the last slide, but talked about earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, Montesquieu was uh, very influential on the Americans uh, in their revolution and beyond the implementation of the Constitution and writing of that document uh, through his uh, emphasis on uh, separation of powers in this book, The Spirit of the Laws. Uh, Locke uh, was a limited government theorist, uh, and uh, you, you can see Locke's influence uh, again in Jefferson's uh, Declaration of Independence and the commitment there to individual liberty uh, and the idea that government's only purpose is to uh, keep everybody's uh, liberties sort of alive. Uh, that's its, that's its only or main purpose, according to limited government theory, uh, stemming from Locke feeding through Jefferson and beyond. Voltaire, the father of the Enlightenment. Uh, this is the guy that probably wrote the most about the most variety of subjects, greatest variety of subjects, uh, and is usually thought to be the most gifted and talented writer of the Enlightenment. He might not have the most, he might not have been the most brilliant mind of the Enlightenment, but he was clearly the best writer, uh, I think clearly, uh, and most uh, you know, analysts uh, think so. Uh, he contributed uh, to, in, in many ways. He wrote all kinds of different books on multiple subjects. He wrote plays. He wrote novels. He wrote scientific tracts. Uh, he wrote a history uh, of the age of Louis the Fourteenth, which you see in the bottom right there. Uh, so he wrote uh, 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 many books in all kinds of different forms, from fiction to nonfiction, uh, and everything in between. If there's anything in between, uh, and uh, so uh, you can't really pin him down easily and say, "Well, his main concerns uh, and his main area of expertise was this." He knew something about everything. Uh, but uh, if you have to boil it down uh, uh, to what he emphasized more than uh, other things, I would say it was tolerance and, and freedom of thought. Uh, uh, religious tolerance, uh, mostly, uh, but uh, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, so that uh, he was thinking about religion uh, uh, most. And he wasn't a particularly religious uh, person, uh, didn't have traditional uh, religious beliefs, though he believed in God, just not in a traditional Christian sense. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, he believed that it was uh, of the utmost importance that freedom of religion be respected uh, and individual rights and freedoms of the kind that the Enlightenment we know is famous for. Uh, Locke uh, was saying this, and Voltaire is saying it as well. Uh, uh, what is tolerance? He said, uh, we are all full of weakness and errors. Let us mutually pardon our follies. This is the last law of nature. It is clear that every private individual who persecutes a man, his brother, because he's, a, he's not of the same opinion, is a monster. Uh, uh, ruminate over that for a minute. Uh, uh, and apply that to uh, you know the modern day. So Voltaire was an extreme uh, supporter of freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, he's noted to have said, though I don't think he actually said this, 
uh, I may not agree with what you say, but I will fight to the death uh, uh, you know, to protect your right to say it. Uh, uh, that's his most famous quote, but I don't think he actually said it. There's quite a bit of uh, debate about it. I don't know. We don't think we have a smoking gun piece of writing that says he actually wrote that anywhere. Sounds good, though, and it's, it's, he certainly believed in the sentiment, so that's why I include it. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the anti-philosoph, philosoph, or the anti-enlightenment, enlightenment thinker. Uh, and I'm not going to read all of this. This is a very noisy slide, but there's a lot to say about Rousseau, uh, as you can see. Uh, Rousseau was somewhat schizophrenic uh, or uh, split personality, uh, whichever metaphor you prefer. Uh, there was a good Rousseau and a bad Rousseau. The good Rousseau tended to be earlier in his career as a writer, much like Voltaire, he became famous, wealthy, uh, and wrote uh, in many different forms, uh, and probably uh, was a more uh, was a deeper thinker than Voltaire, if not quite as gifted as a writer. But he did become famous and wrote bestsellers. Uh, some of his fiction were runaway bestsellers. Uh, so uh, th this guy was a popular writer, but he was an impossible person to get along with. Uh, uh, he was just impossible. Uh, he had lots of quirks and lots of uh, emotional issues, a lot of baggage uh, came with Rousseau. So uh, he was extremely hard to get along with. And not surprisingly then, uh, he started off uh, in his early writings as pro-enlightenment. All of these themes we've been talking about, enlightenment, ideals and values, uh, he uh, came across in his writing. But he eventually turned on the enlightenment uh, and turned on other uh, thinkers of the Enlightenment uh, who had been friends of his. Uh, uh, not the guys on our list here, but uh, some of the other big names in the Enlightenment that we haven't covered here. Uh, he had been intimate friends and colleagues with, uh, and he turned on them and he turned on their ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, thinking uh, informs the French Revolution, uh, much more so than it infor informs the American Revolution. Uh, the uh, At the height of the reign of terror that we'll get to, uh, in our next segment, the which is the craziest part of the French Revolution, where the guillotine was chopping off heads, uh, you know, by the dozens, if not hundreds, a day, uh, insane, uh, out of control violence. Uh, Rousseau was the philosopher of choice uh, of the, French, the radical French revolutionaries like Robespierre. Robespierre was the, the leader uh, of this phase of the revolution, uh, and it's really not surprising. Uh, when you read uh, uh, Rousseau. So most of the Enlightenment thinkers, like Voltaire, uh, like Adam Smith, uh, like Montesquieu, uh, uh, wanted to see something kind of much more moderate and sensible uh, in terms of reform. The Enlightenment project uh, was designed to change Europe uh, uh, for the better, they believed, but not to radically change it. Uh, and uh, Rousseau's ideas are much more radical. Uh, and uh, they, they really are uh, tailor-made for someone who wants to root out all of the old uh, and bring in something entirely new, uh, which is what the French revolutionaries wanted to do uh, and what the American revolutionaries uh, shied away from, and I, in my opinion, rightfully so. Uh, we've been better off for it uh, uh, because of that. Uh, the, the French revolutionaries uh, were much less cautious, uh, much more ambitious, and sought to tear out their entire system, and did, uh, uh, after the Enlightenment, and once the revolution began in 1789, uh, and replace uh, uh, what had been there for hundreds of years uh, completely with something untried and untested, uh, uh, theoretical blueprints, abstract theories, some of it coming from Jean-Jacques Rousseau's book, The Social Contract uh, itself, uh, and uh, uh, the country was the worse for it. So Rousseau, a fellow Frenchman, uh, that's part of the reason I'm sure they picked him up and uh, uh, ran with his ideas later on. But uh, the uh, Americans, uh, like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, they knew about Rousseau as well, uh, and they were uh, much more skeptical uh, that what he was selling and packaging, uh, though he was dead by the time of the revolution, both of them began. Actually, I don't know, 1778, he died in the middle of the American Revolution, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, but the Americans uh, wanted no part of uh, Rousseau's brand of uh, intellectual uh, uh, you know, uh, imprint, uh, but they were uh, keen uh, on Locke, uh, Smith, uh, Montesquieu, the guys we've already talked about. Uh, 